Hello everyone, this is Ross at Teacher Talk at the most influential blog on education in the UK today. I am delighted to be joined by Hayley Hughes. Hayley is a former teacher studying for her doctorate and is deeply fascinated by mentoring, which I think is the focus of your doctorate. Hayley, am I correct? Sort of, yeah. Um, I mean, I'm fascinated by a lot of things. That's my problem. I well, think. that's good, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, that's why I've done three master's degrees. So my husband's a bit fed up with my fascinations. Trying to, yeah, trying to <laughs> narrow it down. So um, could you just give a little synopsis of your life in education, mm -hmm. what you've done and, and what you're doing today? Yeah, Please. absolutely. So it's a bit of a of a convoluted road. So I'll try to be as as brief as possible. Yeah. Um, so I um, I started out as a national newspaper journalist. Never right, wanted wow. to be a teacher in a in a million years. Um, okay. I was probably one of these people that I've hated for the last fifteen years who thought that teachers started work at eight o'clock and finished at three and had all the holidays <laughs> and you okay, know we'll teaching. Forgive you. Yeah, well, I've, I've, <laughs> I've done karma for 15 years of, of living it. Um, but um, yeah, and used to think that like, you know, teaching was something that people did when they couldn't think of what to do with a degree, all of that horrible stuff. Yeah. Um, and then I decided to get some morals and a bit of uh, integrity and quit the national newspaper journalist where I worked. It was currently yes. being investigated for phone hacking um, and I'd there had enough. Go. Um, so I wondered what else I could do with an English degree and I signed up to train to teach and 15 years later and I've only just left the classroom this July yes. um, I had various different roles in a school like most people who work in a school for 15 years um, yeah. and you know middle leader senior leader um, looked after mentoring in schools um yeah. and you know teaching and learning all sorts of different different hats really and i left in july um because uh -huh. increasingly after writing my books you will understand this um i, I was do. being asked to go into schools um and deliver cpd and training for staff and to work with different groups of students and obviously when you're tied into a timetable in a school that's really difficult so yes, i made the move of, of leaving the classroom i now am head of education at Iris Connect, which I right. adore. I get to do research and CPD I all day. I love Iris, yeah. Yes, brilliant. Um, and I'm a senior lecturer at the University of Sunderland as well. So I spearhead their mentoring um, alongside my um, doctorate and trying desperately to finish the two books that I have due to publishers. Frankly, I'm writing all this down. <laughs> I'm just right. I've got, I've nearly filled half the page. Look, already. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I do a lot. Um, yeah, I don't sleep. Right. So, I mean, I, I, I recognize that journey of like being passionate about your subject, school leader, helping other teachers, getting really into a particular topic, writing about it, publishing a book, which is a great opportunity in its own right. But then other people asking for you to come in yeah. uh, and share your wisdom and then that being a battle because you're fixed at a full-time employment timetable and I guess over over time that and yes. becomes a real challenge doesn't it um uh, what's your doctorate in then mentoring um, it's a, a standard kind of doctorate in education, but I'm looking yes. at teacher identity of experienced teachers. So okay. one of my great passions as, a, as an educationalist is experienced teachers. I think very often there's a lot of research, a lot of support put in for early career teachers, but us chips off the old block who've been around the block a few times, you know, we yeah. don't really get a look in. So, no, all, all, you know, all three of the books that I've done are a experienced practitioners um, and okay. that is a real passion of mine right so I'll come back to that because that, that's I'm very interested in that too um, so a question I always ask um, you know just to kind of uh, get to know people um, is could you describe your 16 year old self for, for me and listeners please oh god <laughs> what were you um, like at school oh a nightmare <laughs> Right. <laughs> Complete enough to nightmare. Um, didn't like authority, thought I was cleverer than the teachers. Um, anarchist completely. Um, right. Yeah, and was not much different as a teacher, to be honest. Um, oh, OK. <laughs> Did you get so, yourself in trouble? <laughs> um, sometimes, yeah. I, I learned to harness it you know, as I got as I got older and realised that actually no one practitioner is bigger than a school. And I think that was a hard lesson that I had to learn. Um, yes. But I still don't like the rules. Um, you know, I, I think I throw out the rule book a lot as a teacher. You know, I'm sat right. here talking to you today, Ross, with half yeah. black, half white hair, lots of yeah, tattoos. Yeah, that's pretty cool, um, yeah. <laughs> so, well, so 
Can I, I dig it a bit deeper? Where mm. do you think that kind of energy comes from to, to have that kind of devil in you? <laughs> Gene. Uh, my, my mother, I think. Okay. Um, so, yeah, um, I mean, my mum my, had me when she was 16, very young. Um, and I remember being at the, the school gates waiting for her on a, on a daily basis at school as a very small child and her turning mm -hmm. up with different hair colour pretty much every week. Mm -hmm. um, you mm -hmm. know, she was a new romantic back in the 80s. Um, yeah. And she's always been somebody really who doesn't like to conform sure. and likes to break stereotypes. So I've got a question for you then. You know, if I think back to my... You know, my one of my first NQT roles or early teacher roles in the mm -hmm. 90s was in a Catholic school in Tottenham. Mm -hmm. And I, I, at the time, I wasn't wearing a tie and it was very traditional <laughs> and all those that. And the deputy head used to always come once a week. Ross, have you thought about wearing a tie? All those types of things. <laughs> now, a tie in the grand scheme of things is low end to teachers with tattoos and mm -hmm. piercings and God knows what else um, that some schools may mm -hmm. not advocate Mm -hmm. So my question is, what tips do you have for teachers who may not fit the traditional stereotype of that squeaky clean suit type appearance, uh, you know, skirt and whatever else? I'm, I'm falling into stereotypes here. Uh, yeah. that, that, that traditional view of a teacher, people that don't fit that mould, what would be your advice? Find your home. Um, because there is one um, and the, you know there's many 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 heads some of whom um, I connect with on Twitter on, on mm -hmm. a daily basis who actually see past the superficial things like that about teachers and mm -hmm. they look at their pedagogy and the relationships and the difference that they make to students and I feel quite actually lucky I don't know whether that's the right word because it almost sounds as if you know I've done something wrong by being alternative yeah. but I do feel really lucky that I've worked for two heads uh, well three mm -hmm. actually in my career uh, and all three of them um, you know have never asked me to cover my still dress very smart um, as a teacher every single day but I don't wear suits um, it's yes. not me it's not part of my um, personality and I think if you're not being your authentic self in a school we spend so long there that you will be found out yeah well I think there's a good doctoral question here uh, what impact does wearing a tie have on educational outcomes <laughs> we're so fixated <laughs> by outcomes aren't we <laughs> I think we um, need to right. do some kind of controlled trial or something on it maybe <laughs> So just, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. Um, you know, I know there's some schools out there that it's a, a very uh, rigid discipline with uh, appearance, isn't it? Yes. Um, so just before we move forward, um, go back to kind of your career. C mm -hmm. Can you give us a kind of, you know, um, for people listening to this, maybe outside the UK, you, your, your career has been in the northwest of England? Yes. Uh, of England? In teaching, yes. Northwest, yeah. And um Oh, in secondary schools, English teaching, middle leader, senior leader, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yes, yeah, correct. And any any particular highlights? You know, fond memories. Uh, many, um, a lot of them in my. Um, where I worked with a particularly incredible head in my first school mm -hmm. who retired when I left the school um, and you know just really being given opportunities to to shine um, to, to lead things quite early on in my career and having mm -hmm. that professional trust was mm -hmm. was really beneficial to me I need I need somebody there who is going to so give me the space to to you know stretch my wings as well Sure. And if I just talk about the reasons why you left. Now, I, I, I think I've got a kind of similar story. It's partly the workload from the other things that you're doing mm -hmm. outside of your full time employment, as well as, you know, as you develop a degree of expertise. And we'll come to the, mm -hmm. the experienced teacher part in a moment that you, you develop a degree of wisdom. You repeat it every year. I know my wife felt like this after mm -hmm. 17, 18 years of teaching, you know, the, the, the academic year becomes a very repetitive over time, mm -hmm. the things that you do. Is, my question I want to ask is, were there any negative things that might have made you leave, for example, the workload or the pandemic, or was it all for great positive reasons? Because for me, it was a bit of both. Mm. 
Yeah, I mean, that's a really good question. I think like all teachers who were on the front line, so to speak, uh, during the pandemic, um, it definitely changed my perspective on things like Mm -hmm. work-life balance. I think I've always been somebody who's been quite practical about work-life balance and realised that actually it doesn't exist in teaching. You know, (laughs) you've essentially um, got to to strive for a managed disequilibrium of sometimes, you know, family will come first, sometimes school will. And, you know, I'm lucky that my husband works in education, albeit in a a university, so understands the demands that are Mm -hmm. are on me. Um, So there was a little bit of that, I suppose, but mostly it was the constraints in a school. I think schools are still run the way that they were you know 100 years ago um and i think there isn't the opportunities for experienced teachers who don't necessarily want to be on slt that mm-hmm. there should be um i think that's changing i think with the itt market review and the introduction of these lead mentor roles and other you know mpqltd for example there are going to be those roles for experienced teachers who don't want to be slt but want to be involved in teaching and learning and develop others and mm-hmm. sadly i left at a time when that just isn't really really those roles don't really exist yeah i mean even for me i I wanted to be a part-time deputy head in a special measure of skill and you know that that male ego all those types of things just wasn't entertained um okay let's move forward so when you took the jump was it Mm -hmm. i I'm, i'm assuming that because you worked in another industry it wasn't so scary for me i started teaching when i was 19 so it was all i ever knew so it was a real scary leap of faith um mm. what, what was that process like for you resigna- uh, re- making your resignation going you know taking that leap full time Yeah, I mean, it was scary a little bit because even though I've been a journalist before I was a teacher, you know, the vast majority of my work in life now has been in in the classroom. Mm -hmm. So it was a little bit scary and I wondered whether I was, you know, the whole grass is always greener myth, you know, whether I was going to hate it. Um, And, you know, I loved my colleagues that I worked with. My department was incredible and, you know, I'm still very good friends with all of them. Um, So, yeah, it was just a massive, massive leap and it's been a huge transition transition I've actually found the transition to HE um more difficult than I ever could have imagined that it would be right. to be quite honest and what what reason for that just the terminology the way of working the, the different level of rigor or yeah, lots of different reasons. I don't think it's the level of rigour because I don't think things can be more rigorous than in a secondary <laughs> school or a primary school, to be honest, yes. with how, you know, QA, etc. Yeah. It's been more like, you know, um, Pierre Bourdieu writes about the university, doesn't he? And like the, the academic kind of um, conventions that, that people live by. And I just felt like a, a fish out of water, I guess. Um, you know, I didn't understand any of the acronyms, um, you know, and, and I work at distance as well, which I should. Yeah. Bad. So yes. um, I work at the University of Sunderland and live on the Lancashire Yorkshire border. So yeah. it's even harder to do those things like turning to somebody in an office and saying, "What on earth is this acronym?" Yeah, I yeah, can't do totally. that. So yes. you know, it's been it's been a learning Different curve. challenges, and I, I guess you also had a few feelers that you could take a leap of faith because of your books or people mm-hmm. asking you to do speaking events. I guess those in the you know, if people weren't asking you to do those things, you wouldn't know if you could take that. I guess the income leap, isn't it, to leave a, yes. a regular salary? Um, yeah. You know, we, we before we came online, I, I suppose we just say it for the benefit of the listeners that, you know, when you work for yourself, every pound matters. You have yes. to work, and you, you said that you're working right up to Christmas Eve. It would be your only day off, perhaps, over the break. And mm-hmm. and you know that 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 the the, the freedom comes with its challenges in, in a different respect, doesn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And then, you know, you're absolutely right. It had got to probably May and I had, uh, you know, 40 bookings or something that I was being asked to do. And I just thought, yeah. I can't, I can't do this. So I knew sure. the appetite was there. Um, I'm definitely not somebody who's going to rest on my laurels because I think, you know, the, 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 the bookings aren't going to last forever on no. this one book. Um, well, yeah, the, to do this, you know, for me, it's my fifth year or something like that now, yes. but to do, it, mm-hmm. to do it at the start of a pandemic or in the <laughs> middle of the pandemic it's a real yeah. difficult one uh, what, what what lessons have you learned you know how is it going you know the ups and downs you know that self-employment type uh, former teacher role there'll be a lot of people listen to this that are considering it or people that are already doing it and just want to bounce ideas because it can be quite a lonely business quite mm-hmm. solo and there's a little network of us i suppose so uh, what, what have been the highs and lows so far in the last six months 
I think the highs, I've been getting the chance to travel around the country and go into different schools and meet teachers Mm -hmm. um, from all different kind of levels of experience and to learn Mm -hmm. so much from them because I absolutely believe that when I come into a school, I'm not stood there as an expert. I'm stood there as somebody who has got an opinion about something and I've got a big enough gob to shout about it, essentially. (laughs) Um, But I've learned so much from interactions with other colleagues. So that's definitely the highlight. Mm -hmm. I think that points have been not having that day-to-day interaction with teenagers that I normally yes. have. I've got my own teenager at home who actually goes to my old school that I left in July um, and right. he just grunts at me um, so it's not <laughs> quite the same and also not having colleagues so um, even though I have amazing colleagues at Iris Connect and at Sunderland yeah. we're connecting on a digital basis and it's yes. not quite the same. Hey, I wonder if um, there's an idea for us to think about creating a little network of education consultants mm. of some kind, you know, because there's SLT chat that I created years ago and there's other potential things. But I've thought for a while now that there needs to be a little network for us all to come together, share ideas, processes, protocols, be ups and downs. Mm-hmm. Anyway, we'll part that one for now, but that's, a, that's an idea. Um, so, you know, the ups and downs, the, you know, the usual things are through the pandemic. My, my next question is, what kind of things have you been asked to do? Um, all sorts. Um, so from working kind of um, in a small collaborative group of four or five um, team members in a school, um, mm-hmm. literally panning out their whole mentoring provision um, mm-hmm. to going into schools and providing uh, an academic lecture for for year 11 students on, on Romeo and Juliet. So right. huge difference. Yeah, so I guess you've got that in- English expertise as well as yes. your mentoring mm-hmm. passion. Um, now, um, what kind of things have you learned from visiting lots of different institutions? You know, you get that lovely radar to go and see different places and you see how some of your ideas work in some places. Mm-hmm. Some are well received, some go down like a lead balloon. What what, what kind of things have you picked up? I think I've picked up that teachers are very tired um, and that, you know, when you go into a school, it's not about going in with this kind of panacea of this is going to change your lives. It's Mm -hmm. about trying to make it relevant for their context um, Mm and listening to what their their needs are. Um, I think, you know, Mark and Zoe Enza's brilliant book about CPD spelled it out for me about how CPD needs to be tailored. It needs to be bespoke. Mm -hmm. And I think going in with a one size fits all and expecting everybody to just lap it up. It's not yes. it's not going to work. No. Um, and I think I've learned over the last kind of three or four months of doing this that actually um, being questioned by people, but pe- having to win hearts and minds um, is actually part of the process. And, yes. I, and I think, you know, um, I enjoy it now. And I was scared of it when I first. Yeah, started. well, it's, it's like that. Yeah, it's a one off supply day experience for you. You've got to build relationships very quickly. Yes. Uh, gain a bit of trust, get that feedback in the room. It's pretty much what teachers do day in, day out, I suppose. But doing yeah. it a, a, as a one-off gig is quite a big, big, tough ask. Um, so I have. To, I want to switch to mentoring. Um, before I do, let, let's just quash uh, or get some definitions. What's coaching? What's mentoring, in your opinion? What's the difference? <laughs> I knew you were going to ask me this. Um, so tra- traditionally, um, I think mentoring has been an, an expert or somebody more expert working with a novice, um, yes. you know, ha- guiding them, um, then re- that will result as they become more experienced at becoming a reflective practitioner, that will result in them being able to lead their own practice a little bit more. Yeah. I think coaching for me is more about people who are more e- on, of an equal footing. Um, that might be in, in, you know, two colleagues working together um, mm-hmm. where there is no hierarchy, um, where it's very much two people um, passing ideas, having that, mm-hmm. that professional dialogue um, and, and giving suggestions and, and steering your own um, development. And you've written a couple of books on mentoring. So um, could you talk about maybe your first book? You know, what what, what was the particular focus? Yeah, so um, I mean, it's one one book on mentoring at the moment. Um, right. I've got another one due due with Crown House after Christmas that I'm woefully behind on. Um, mm-hmm. But yes, so I wrote mentoring in schools, and it, and this came from um, my. I was asked by Professor Sam Twistleton to come to a DFE round table that she was right, looking nice. at on the on the core content framework, um, mm-hmm. and I just found it really interesting, and my heart sang a little at the the um, emphasis on how important and vital mentoring 
doing is for early career teachers. So mm-hmm. I thought, do you know what? There's a, there's a book here. So I wrote the book and it's aligned to the early career framework. So it's very right. topical. It's very of the moment. Um, and essentially it sets out, it's broken down into sort of behind each of the um, sections of the the early Mm. career framework, so the teacher standards. It's broken down to the research that underpins the the framework. um, And then there's case studies. Uh, I did some... um, qualitative research with about 100 mm-hmm. um, new mm-hmm. teachers uh, that was on online like this on the phone met some face to face so it's got their yeah. experience in and then it's got practical strategies bridging the gap between that theory and practice of, of actually what mentors can do to go away and, and help nice so uh, uh, like you said a book a, a book very timely at the moment uh, yeah. and I guess it um, maybe I'm wrong did it form a large part of your work at the moment or at least your passion yeah, very much so. So the mentoring, obviously, it's very, as you say, very timely, very topical. Mm-hmm. Um, and a lot of what I'm being asked to, to come in and schools about is about mentoring. Some mm-hmm. is about disadvantaged pupils. I come from a background of disadvantage and, and have written quite a lot about that in, in the press. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I also talk about teacher well-being quite a lot as well of experienced teachers. Sure. And, and, and what about your Preserving Positivity book? Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, so give, give people listening a, a summary. You know, you talk about, um, I, I'm a, you know, it's the mindset and mm-hmm. have a positive attitude as a, as a teacher employee. Is that the perspective? Mm-hmm. Yeah, essentially. Um, I mean, it's a very honest book. Um, I'm a very honest person. I'm not going to go in with, you know, flowers and chocolates and go, isn't teaching wonderful? Because sometimes it's bloody awful. Um, And, um, you know, the whole point of preserving positivity um, is that it's told from the point of view of somebody who probably would have left four or five times because of particular toxic things that had happened in my career and I didn't I moved schools I I rode it out I found other things to fulfill me and that's Mm -hmm. what it's about again it's looking at the reasons why people leave the profession at case studies of practical things that have have Mm -hmm. worked and and tangible ways that people can make a difference I mean you know this was written when I was in the classroom I do feel a bit of a charlatan now I've left the classroom however I probably will go back to the classroom at some stage, but I just had mm-hmm. to take this opportunity now. Yeah, sure. I mean, uh, you know, I've you know, I, I did twenty plus years or so, mm-hmm. and um, I, I remember often as a blogger, you know, a lot of people were externally shouting lots of ideas, and it's frustrating yeah. if you're on the front line, all those types of things. Mm-hmm. And now I'm on the other side. I, I do trying my best to support and challenge from the within, particularly during a pandemic. It's really tricky. Yes, but. Um, I kind of look back in hindsight, some of my views are probably a bit narrow and it's, it's a personal thing more than anything that there are people outside of the classroom that can contribute and support schools. Yes. And the, mm-hmm. like you said, there's, uh, we said earlier, there's a whole industry of people working outside of full time school life that do a huge service to ensure s- school success. Um, so, yeah, it's a very interesting point you make about, um, you know, how perhaps just moving to a different school can unleash your Mm -hmm. your mojo again is that what happened to you yeah it Um, did um yeah I mean I was being bullied actually um which I talk about in the book and I've written about in in the press as well um I was being bullied by a member of SLT who was quite Machiavellian um and you know he made my life hell essentially and made me feel like I was a rubbish teacher um so you know I had to move for my own self-preservation what what surprises me about education you know any any sector I suppose but within education where we work with children there are people bullying colleagues in yes. our in our schools and, and it's a sad indictment that you know we're human nature and these things will be evident everywhere but yeah that's why why I published a book called Toxic Schools with Dr mm. Helen Woodley a number of years ago now just trying to um lift the carpet on this toxic culture that exists in some schools um could I ask one more question on that topic highly um mm-hmm. was it a, do you think it was an individual thing or do you think it was um a cultural thing that was allowed to kind of thro- breed in that school or was it just an individual personality that t- took a dislike to you um it was an individual personality but he did it to a lot of different people um right. and and actually it was accepted because that was just the way he was um right. and many people ended up leaving the school because of it and actually this person was asked to leave eventually um, oh, good good so you know, but it took years. I mean, I dread. Yeah, and there's a lot of casualties you know, along the way, isn't yes, it? Sadly, yeah. but um, 
Okay, so then I, I guess we move on to that experience. You know, you've got that person's experience as a bully, uh, and then you've got your own experience, um, and then we kind of move towards your doctorate research. So mm -hmm. give us a little kind of synopsis as to why this has become your focus, you know, are, you know, doing it part time, uh, what institution, etc. Just give us a, a, a whistle stop tour of where you're at. Yeah, so I'm at Glasgow, uh, the University of Glasgow. Um, I okay. chose that because of its reputation, essentially. Um, mm -hmm. And um, I am in year four, so I'm supposed to be doing my dissertation as we speak. I've got yes. uh, about a year and a half left to do you're it. You're on a podcast with me instead of writing it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll be honest with you, Ross. Um, I haven't really read anything since September. Um, so, tr you know, try changing careers I'm completely because that's what I, I've been doing myself but, uh, yeah honestly like my supervisor is going to kill me the next time it's I, hard, I see isn't him it? it's the hardest oh. thing I've ever done yeah I agree like totally I think the first three years at Glasgow were taught so that was much easier because I had specific deadlines I had to to work yes. to but now yes. it's like you're in year four you're on your own good luck yeah it's you know? hard I mean I, 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 haven't, I haven't been to Cambridge for two years physically since the pandemic wow. and you know it kills me to say it but all the seminars and lectures have been virtual and mm. there's been I'm just not motivated to turn up to any of them because we're all zoomed out, I suppose. So, yeah, um, yeah it, I think it's also, you know, a degree of independence when you're at that level. You've just got to crack on with it. So you check in with your supervisor, et cetera. I, I think also the pandemic for me, you know, working solo, uh, ha, you know, chasing the pounds ha, doesn't mm -hmm. give you much time to focus on research, which is, you know, something that you do as a kind of byproduct or, or, or interest, uh, et cetera. Um, so on that note, how, how, give me some tips, because I know that I've been struggling with this personally. How have you narrowed your focus? Well, I knew that I wanted to do something about experienced teachers. Um, mm -hmm. And I really like the writing of Pierre Bourdieu. Um, mm -hmm. So particularly on kind of habitus and field yes. uh, rather than specifically kind of cultural capital, which seems to be a lot of what people talk about when it comes to the ideas behind Bordeaux. Um, but yes. obviously they're all they're all enmeshed anyway. Um, and I got the opportunity um, because of a global pandemic to look at um, experienced teacher identity through the COVID-19 pandemic. I just thought right. it was a really interesting dynamic The lot that yes. a lot of the things that we take for granted as teachers, like in the interaction with students, all of those things that are in the field of the school that are in our habitus as a teacher mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, are now taken away. And, and I wanted to know what effect that had on the you know experienced teachers understanding. So how do you define experience after a number of years of service or an age? Yeah. I think five years plus uh, because okay. the DFE define um, early career teachers as before five years. Okay, so you're at the stage where you're kind of writing, you know, your kind of final pitch, so to speak. Um, no, I've Fine. done that. Uh, right, yeah, so I've done submission. that. So, yeah, I'm now on uh, the literature uh, review, um, and then I'll be putting. I'm in not my laughing. Ethics. I'm not laughing. <laughs> so, yeah, next year is ethics in January, and then um, oh. study in in summer probably. Right. Well, you're a bit ahead of me because I've really struggled to narrow it down, but I, I think I'm on the. The theme of corpus linguistics, which is oh, large bodies exciting. of text. Yeah, which is new territory. I, I'm not a social scientist. I'm a DT teacher. But yeah. I've, I've, I've seen to, uh, I've now got a focus of corpus linguistics, looking at the sentiment analysis of the text. So there's a great paper published last year by Dr. Sam Sims and Christian Bokov. They did some, I think I tweeted it about a month ago. Um, they gathered the text mining language of 17,000 Ofsted reports, which was fascinating. But you may have seen on my Twitter feed where I've been tweeting little social network maps. Mm -hmm. So my plan is, and this is the challenge to narrow it, is when Ofsted publish a blog or a document, mm -hmm. what's, you know, the corpus linguistics aspects of it, but what's the sentiment analysis? And then when people talk about it online, what are they saying? How does that conversation spread? That's so interesting. And what I'm really fascinated is what does Hiley or Ross say on Twitter about this publication that later leads to a change in policy or a, mm. uh, an Ofsted later announcement. So it's a tricky one to unpick, but I, I'm confident I've observed it on Twitter for myself for the last uh, 15 years or so. So I'd mm. like to 
put it on paper. <laughs> uh, but that's my current challenge and focus. Um, so yeah, it's, it's really interesting. So yeah, I, I know it's early days for you, but you know, what kind of the, what are the kind of things that are emerging from the things that you're unpicking? I think the the a lot of experienced teachers missed those informal chats with colleagues um, because mm -hmm. those in themselves are a form of teacher development. So you know, mm -hmm. I remember my from my own experience, if I was teaching a text, I might stop a, a colleague or, while we're having a brew in the staff room and say, "How are you approaching this particular aspect of this? You know, or what about this student? Or how yeah. would you do this? You know, it's all of those things." Um, yeah. I think as well the 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 identity of, of putting your smart clothes on every day, of coming to school, of acting out this role as a, as a role model, really, around students and yeah. not having that. And instead, those boundaries being broken and, and students being able to see into your homes, to meet your pets. Um, yeah. you know to have children yeah. in the background and I think those professional boundaries that we put up as a teacher because of that standard one about setting yes. high expectations yes. you know it's I think those were broken and a lot of experienced teachers who've been in the classroom for a long time found that quite difficult to deal yeah, with. Yeah because I mean I, I know that um, I battled with the real Ross and the teacher Ross at school Yes. And as you get a bit older, you get a bit more comfortable about being yourself and you you, yes. choose, you can get a bit more confident about letting people into your personal circumstances. And then I think when you become a school leader, it becomes a bit harder because you have to also, uh, although there's not any clear written rules, you, there is, over time there comes a bit of a clear separation between the general staff body yes. and the leadership team. And that's also an interesting uh, dynamic. So the experienced teachers, have you broken this down into – you know, the kind of middle leaders and school leaders, so you can get a sense of different bits of Data. Yes, I intend to. Yeah. So when when I put my uh, proposal in, that was one of the things that I intended, because I think, as you say, having experience being a senior leader myself, um, yeah. the, one of the things I found the hardest to deal with, actually, was going into a staff room and people stopping talking. Um, yes. And I think that says it all, really. There uh -huh. is going to be a difference in, in their perspectives. So, yeah, so uh, can I pin you down for an estimate publication? <laughs> um, well, do you know what? If uh, to, to be honest, if I pass my Viva, I think I would be crying with happiness. Um, so I, I have no plans to publish it um, right. at, at, at the moment. Um, however, yeah. maybe I'll get a book out of it. Who knows? A couple of years or something, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, now, we haven't talked about uh, Iris. We, we, yes. we, I love Iris. So let's uh, – let's, what, what was the head of education role uh, – contain what what kind of things are you doing um, so I'm developing new content for, for the platform. We've got this really exciting launch in January where we're launching an instructional coaching pathway, right. um, a reflective pathway, and also something called the Practice Exchange, which is essentially bite-sized theory, CPD, for teachers so they can steer their own development and also video exemplifications of those strategies in action. Fantastic. I've always wanted Iris to marry the Chartered College or someone like that so that I have a professional Facebook of video footage and certificates so that yeah. when I connect with Hailey as a head teacher, I can let you see my portfolio of car crash lessons, reflections <laughs> and brilliant. And it's there. And, and yeah. we've got the technology to do this rather than this notion that I have to go to an interview teach a, a fake class of kids that I don't know mm -hmm. in, a, in, a, in a, a, an abstract environment and no one really gets a true sense of how good or I am or would I fit into the school, et cetera, et cetera. So can you pass that one to Iris for me again, that we need to try and marry up with someone and get this technology uh, available. They have it in Scotland and they have it yeah. in Wales. We don't have it in England, sadly. I think um, I need to arrange a meeting with you with our CEO, um, Andy Newell, yes. because I think he'd well, love it. Yeah, I've posed that to Andy a few years ago, so send him a little nudge. And I will. Let's, <laughs> let's see if we can work out something. Um, right, my, my next question then is, uh, so tell me what you're doing at Sunderland. Um, so I started out as an English PGCE lecturer. I'm still doing a little bit of that. I'm doing subject studies because obviously I'm very recently come out of the classroom. So it's good yes. for the students to, uh -huh. to have that input. But I'm now a lecturer in professional development. So I'm right. working on right. the master's course, um, some coaching and mentoring qualifications and really kind of spearheading, I guess, um, yes. Sunderland mentoring provision. 
So you're you are juggling loads of balls. <laughs> a lot yeah I mean I've got yeah. very understanding employers so Andy Newell um, has been amazing with me going into schools and, and speaking um, as long as I get my my deadlines done and my work done it's yeah. very flexible so you're doing all these different things in a, mm -hmm. a kind of self-employed capacity so you can juggle different hats and choose yeah, well, your work but meet yeah. deadlines or or yeah, I'm assuming there's some formal agreements in there, but it's, it's oh. what I think. What I'm trying to say is, you've got such an interesting stuff, <laughs> range of stuff going on. It's it's it, it, you no doubt you're busy, but super exciting at the same time. Yeah, I mean it's amazing. I mean I'm not I'm I'm employed Iris and I'm employed at Sunderland, and then I do mm -hmm. the speaking self-employed. So it's a bit of an odd situation, really. Yeah. But so, so I'll give you what uh, one last big question, and I'll start <laughs> to wrap it up a little bit. Um, you know, given that you took that leap of faith to go out and now you've got all these different things going on and some will be mm -hmm. brilliant, some might go, you know, a little wavy up and down kind of mood. Where did where was the original intention of stepping out in terms of what, what pathway did you hope to pursue? Uh, you know, I guess the question is, where do you see yourself in two or three years time in, in terms of this self-employment? And you also mentioned mm -hmm going back to school at some point mm, yeah I mean in in the short term in the next five years um, it'd be mm -hmm. great to become the director of education at Iris maybe who knows right, uh, right. I've got okay. to prove myself a there's a bit. plug for people listening. <laughs> that's it yeah are you listening um, but um, yeah um, and, and you know I'm very happy to carry on uh, working in teach training in some capacity um, yes and not sure whether that's in HE or whether that's uh -huh. in, in somewhere like Teach First or, or somewhere that's more of a teaching school hub. Uh, but I do like having a foot in both camps. Um, I do, you know, in five years plus, who knows, mm -hmm. it'd be great to go and work for um, a trust, perhaps doing yeah. mentoring across the, the trust um, okay, or, or some kind of teaching and learning. Maybe Johnny Utley, who I would love to work with at some oh, yeah. point. So we there you Johnny, go, big yeah. shout out. There's another plug, Johnny, if you're listening. <laughs> oh, he knows. He knows. Right. I'm always mivering him. <laughs> <laughs> now, there's a word I've not heard for a while, but I've heard it lots lot since I moved up north. Yes. Mithering. <laughs> mithering. So for people yeah. listening elsewhere in the UK and outside the UK, what does mithering mean? It means and bothering. And how do you spell it? And how do you spell it? Um, M I. It's like mothering with an I, but yeah, yes. it's bothering, annoying somebody. <laughs> <laughs> annoying somebody. Um, right. Uh, now, and I probably know the answer to this, but what's your synopsis of COVID for teachers? You know, workload, headaches, mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, you know, so that's initial synopsis. And what, what are your hopes? Yeah, I mean, I think it's just been an absolute nightmare for teachers, to be quite honest. I don't know how they've carried on because in July I was on my knees um, and by all intents and purposes from listening to colleagues on the ground been worse this half term mm -hmm. in many ways mm -hmm. um so i think it's just been awful for them and they're complete and utter champions uh, they deserve every accolade going my hopes i guess are that um, there is more respect um in the media for teachers after this more respect from parents mm -hmm. i think that's happened a little bit um because certainly uh, when i was still at school last year um some parents said to me oh my god i realize how hard work they are now and the stuff you've got to do and how difficult it is uh, because teaching isn't an easy job and I think teachers deserve the same respect um mm -hmm. you know as any other frontline worker what would be your, your advice to your young journalist self <laughs> Um, don't do don't don't do what they're asking you to do get out um you know um <laughs> get get a mo there's more to life <laughs> have you ever uh, did you ever write a headline that you regretted Oh, many, many, many. Um, I mean, they they usually always had some kind of awful pun in, definitely. <laughs> yeah. So, so there you go, right? So, Hayley, you know, um, if you if people listening will know that now we've gone through a bit of deep mm -hmm. and meaningful. I'm going to pose loads of quick fire questions. I'm sure you're, yes. without offending you, old enough to remember mallets, mallets, and yes, like I that. do. So yeah, pose, yeah. <laughs> and I don't have a virtual hammer to hang hang in the head, but I'm going to pose loads of questions your way, and I don't want I want you to be succinct and not pause or hesitate if that's possible so we'll start easy now you're juggling lots of hats but so what project are you working on on your desk today i'm doing my book my next book, book. which is a critical okay. theory book yeah right and what books are you reading I am reading The Beginner's Guide to Cooperative Learning. I have a copy oh. there, which I've just been sent by Crown House and was lucky enough to write a testimonial for. Right, fantastic. Um, finish the sentence. If I was Secretary of State for Education, I would. Um, 
Oh God, I don't. I don't think I want to say. Um, I would we'll give a, we'll teachers an extra week off. Yep. <laughs> an, an extra week off. Now that would be uh, well received. Maybe not so for parents. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, piece of advice for a teacher wanting to get deeper into research or maybe want to start a doctorate. I think just go for it. You'll think I can't do this. How am I going to do it? But you just make it. Work. Okay. Your favourite tattoo on yourself. I think my latest one, which is my fingers, and it says life is a cabaret. Okay, nice. Can you show us that again on the camera? Beautiful. Yeah, yeah. Look at that. Life. And and uh, any regrets, Tattoo, one that you wish you hadn't got? Is there any? Yeah, I've got Morrissey on my arm and he's turned into <laughs> an absolute muppet. So, yeah, oh, that's no. pretty, pretty <laughs> distressing. <laughs> so there you go. Now, if you're not doing your dream job now, what was that? off the wall career that you wanted to have you know growing up that you never did i'd love to be a librarian if it paid more i oh, would you well there you go um piece of advice for any an anarchy teachers out there <laughs> um be subversive so do what you've got to do nod smile but you know be subversive be subversive um what are you most proud of your biggest career achievement um, probably um, working in a special measures school for, for seven years and it was really tough, but I know I made a difference to those students. There you go. Um, now, you mentioned earlier in our chat, um, chats as CPD. Um, what were you, you know, what are your favourite tips for having little conversations day to day to boost morale for yourself or for other colleagues? What's your piece of advice? I think tell somebody how good they are at something. I don't think we do that enough. And mm -hmm. every single colleague that we work with is brilliant at something in the classroom. And I think it's about making people more aware of that and the fact that we appreciate them. Mm -hmm. Great little tips. Um, if I, I've been to Diggle, where, where you live. If I, if I came over to Diggle for 24 hours, what would we do? Where would we go to eat, have a drink? What's, the, what's there to see? Um, oh, well, Diggle, my goodness me, you know, it's it's a hive of activity. Well, I'd take you to Diggle Chippy um, for their, nice. for their like famous it. rag pudding. Um, so we'd have rag pudding, chips and gravy. We'd sit by the, the duck pond and we'd feed our scraps to the ducks, maybe go for a walk to Grandpa Green's for ice cream afterwards. Right. Sounds sounds very relaxing. Um, who would you recommend I interview next and why? Because uh, um, I love to dig out my recording. I think someone recommended you. I need to dig out who it was. Oh, but, um, well, so that's why I'm with them. you. But um, who would you recommend? Um, I would recommend that you interview um, Professor Rachel Lofthouse <coughs> next. Um, okay, I'm, because, I'm chase Rachel. Okay. Yeah, because I think um, there's a lot of um, talk at the moment about uh, what instructional coaching is and isn't. Um, and I think Rachel's got some really interesting perspectives on it as someone who works with Jim Nine. Now, I was going to ask you that question. What is instructional coaching? I don't want to put my <laughs> cynical hat on, but what, in your definition, what is it? It depends what definition you you're looking right, for okay. because there's many. Um, right, so, we'll so leave I, it there. yeah, <laughs> leave it there maybe ask to. Rachel. <laughs> okay, I'll chase Rachel down. Um, where can listeners find out more about you? You know, online links, blogs. I know you've got the, a blog, um, the Ink Teacher, which is fascinating. Is that something you regularly update? It's not. I need to do it more. Um, that's going to be my New Year's resolution, I think, um, to update my blog more. So, yeah, the Ink Scholar um, is my blog. Um, I'm quite active on Twitter, probably not as active as I used to be because I just have no time uh, with yes. jobs, etc. at the moment. Sure. Um, but, yeah, so it's a place to, to find me. Um, and my books are all on, on Amazon and WH Smith, etc. Et so there you go. Um, uh, Hi, I've got one more question. Um, yes. What would you hope to be your legacy? Um, I just hope that I've made some challenging students who hate Shakespeare and hate English not hate it as much, um, mostly. <laughs> and also that I've given alternative teens um, who were a bit like me, who, who yeah. you know, see no nobody in front of them who looks like them, who's a role model, the opportunity to know that you don't have to dumb down your light to shine. What a lovely little expression. Um, so, highly thank you. It's been lovely to connect and lovely to pick your brains. And I wish you all the best with all the different exciting things that you're juggling, particularly doctorate. I'm going to look forward to that when you get something published. And, uh, yeah, in this, now I'm living up your way in a pandemic world. Hope we can catch up soon physically. That would be amazing. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so, thanks for your time, Hayley. Bye for now.